let me recap. Yesterday was a crazy, I, I shot just lots of, 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 of content at you yesterday. And I, and I want to recap a little bit. Um, so, you know, we started with Colossians chapter 3, verses 1 through 4. And it said that very strange thing, that you, that is you who believe in Jesus, you have been raised with him. Past tense. Do you remember this? And you have died. It's kind of weird. I'm still alive. And, and, I, and I taught you that that's, that's all a reference to union with Christ. That there's some mysterious thing that happened and we're united to Christ in his death and his resurrection. That's the center of the center of the Bible. Remember what I talked about that? That I learned from my professor at Westminster Seminary. And in that passage, it also says something very strange. Your life is hidden <laughs> with Christ in God. Your life is hidden with Christ, union with Christ, in God. And then it said, when Christ is revealed, okay, when Christ is revealed, then you, <laughs> you will actually be revealed. Who you actually really are, it won't be hidden anymore, but who you really are, will finally be really revealed. So in a very strange way, when you look at yourself, it's hidden. <laughs> Your real part is actually kind of hidden. It's something not you don't quite see. When Christ is revealed, then who you really are will be revealed. It's all about union with Christ. Okay? And, then we, and then I gave you a bunch of different language. What, what is this union with Christ? And I talked about, uh, is it, is it uh, legal? So a lot of people think that union with Christ is primarily about justification. What he did for us on the cross and then his righteousness as credit to us. It's a legal union. So for some people just, they, 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 that's all they kind of emphasize. Some people say, I need to be renovated. I need to be changed inside. And so I need power. I need his power. So they don't think about what Christ did in his, that we now have a once and for all standing before the Jesus one for us. But now they're, they're, only, they're, only, they're just it's their power to change, okay? And then some people, I, and then I shifted gears and I used another, um, some other language. Some people talk about covenantal union. And I heard that there were some questions. Covenantal union, uh, mystical union, is this something more? It's all the same, okay? Union with Christ. John Calvin used the language communion with Christ. Um, some, uh, sometimes John Calvin uses the language that uh, we are actually one body with Christ. Same language. Our sister this morning, she said that they're going to teach the kids um, about later in the day, Jesus is the vine and we are the branches. You see that? He's the vine. We're the branches that come off of him. You know what that is? Union with Christ. That's union with Christ out of the Gospel of John. So, in, in a sense, all this is the same, same thing. Different language, covenantal union, mystical union, uh, communion with Christ. All of it is the same thing, and it just tends to cause sometimes some confusion. And it, it just helps a little bit because it emphasizes something a little bit different, like communion. Communion means you're communing together. We're walking together with Christ, communion with Christ. So that emphasizes, so the emphasis is a little different, but it's basically the same. Now then, I close my message with a teaching from 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And so let, let me ask you to go there. If you have your Bible, all right, so we won't, we'll do it, let's, let's do it the old school way. Have your actual, the best technology ever invented right here, okay? This is the best technology, okay? God's technology, the Bible. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And I'm going to move from, this is the last point I gave last night. And then I'm going to pick up here and then move into, I have two points for you this morning. So this, this message and this first message is sort of like two, two parts. Two parts and then two parts. Okay, it's four parts. So, sorry, four. <laughs> it's kind of a lot still, I understand, but... These first two is finishing up last night, and then I'll give you two parts, which some of you are starting to ask about. What does this union with Christ start to look like? What does it look like? How is it, like, is, how is it going to change the way I, I live and look about at my life? And that's the second two parts, okay? That's the, 
We're going to talk about that all day, all this today. So let's look at that incredible verse that we looked at yesterday, 1 Corinthians 15, um, verse 45. So this is about the resurrection. It says, the first man, Adam, became a living being. So that's the first Adam. We are all in Adam. The Bible has a different language. They sometimes call it, you are in the flesh. And I like to say flesh is like rotting meat. That means there's no Holy Spirit. <laughs> there's no God in the flesh. You're just like rotting meat. That's Adam. You're alive because Adam was dust. And then God breathed life into, that's what it says in Genesis, he breathed life into the dust, the spirit breathed into the dust, and he became alive. So that's what it says. He became a living being, and then he says, but, but the last Adam became a life-giving spirit. The last Adam is whom? It's Jesus. But it's not just Jesus, it's the resurrected Jesus. That's what this passage is talking about. The resurrected Jesus is a new kind of human being. It's a new kind of human being. And that human being, he conquered death and sin. Sin came at him, killed him. The world was filled with sin and self-righteousness, and killed him, crucified him. But then his, he had a different kind of humanity and it defeated sin and death through his resurrection. And that is what the Bible calls last Adam. And, and, and there's a strange word for it. He's a life-giving spirit. And that was the last point I wanted to get across to you. John Calvin teaches from this passage, and I, it's a weird, it's a really weird verse. Um, I, I thought about this verse for many, many years. The first time, you know, you just, you know, when, you, when you're younger, you just read these passages like, I don't know what that means. Okay, let's move on. <laughs> do, you, do you do that? You read the Bible? I don't know what that means. The pastor knows. Let's move on. But now I'm the pastor, and I go, I don't know what that means. <laughs> I, I, I don't think I know what that means. And then my professor, Richard Gaffin, explained it. And he cites John Calvin. I said, wow, these guys know the Bible a lot. Like, And if you think about it, Jesus is the Son of God, but he came in a life-giving spirit. The first time I, I thought about that verse, I was like, wait a second, doesn't that confuse the two persons of the Trinity? <laughs> the Son of God became spirit. That seems to confuse the two of them, and that's wrong. <laughs> There's three persons in the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and you can't swap them out. Like, the Son does not become the Spirit. The Spirit does not become the Son. If you do that, that's that's really serious error, okay? That's like, a, that's like you're cutting to the heart of Christianity. There are three eternal persons. And when I first read this, I thought, that seems like a straight-out heresy out of the Bible. But that's not what the Bible is teaching, of course. You know what it's saying? It's not saying that the Son of God, out of His divinity, became the Holy Spirit. That's not what it's saying. It's saying that the man, Jesus Christ... The man, Jesus Christ, who is resurrected, now he is a life-giving spirit. That the Holy Spirit uses him, the Spirit comes out of him, and gives life. That he, he, is, a, a, he is a new kind of human being that conveys life-giving spirit. What's the life-giving spirit? The Holy Spirit. What's the only life-giving spirit there is in God? The Holy Spirit. It's God himself. So last, I ended last night saying, how, what actually is the union with Christ? How are you united to Christ? And I quoted John Calvin. You know how John Calvin learned this? From this verse. There's Jesus. Who is Jesus? Most of us, when we think about Jesus, we just think Jesus is God. Jesus is the Son of God. We think about the divinity of Christ. But if you only think about the divinity of Christ, you, you're not thinking about the full Christ. The, the, Jesus is of, absolutely, of course, the Son of God, and if He isn't the Son of God, He cannot be our Savior. But if He is also not the man, Jesus, He cannot be our Savior. What is our Savior? The Savior had to become a human being so that He could give us a new kind of human life. 
the new kind of human life that can defeat sin and death. And then we are bonded to this new kind of human life, the, the last Adam. Adam is the first of his kind. And we're all like him, and that's why we're all dying, and that's why we're all so self-righteous, and that's why we're so awful, just like him. But we need to become like the new Adam, the last Adam, a different kind of human being. And what, how are we bonded to him? By the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit brings us the life of that new Adam and gives it into our life. That's what the union with Christ is about. Everything that is in the life of the new kind of human being, the new kind of Adam, is being conveyed to us by being bonded to him through the Holy Spirit. Okay, you hearing what I'm saying? Now, um, I got, if you look at your outline, Roman number number one. What does it mean to be human? What does it mean to be human? Most of us, we have a very wrong view of what it means to be human. Are you a little surprised by that? The average human being figures out what it means to be human by looking at other human beings. <laughs> Kids are born, they look at their daddy, and then they think, this is how I'm supposed to, I mean, that's the normal way. You, you know, if you're a boy, you look at your dad. You figure out, I'm like him, not like her. And then you act, and then that, that's why our society is so confused. You know, when you have no more dads, it creates a lot of confusion. You know, it's like you just have one parent, and it's harder. It's just straight up harder. Now, because when you're little, you have to figure out, who am I? You don't know who you are. Does somebody love me? Does somebody care about me? That's, that's a big problem with like fatherlessness and parent, being orphans. They don't even know who they are. Am I valued? It's a big problem. But, you know, that's actually healthy. You, you look at, you figure out that that one, he look, he's like me. He's a, he's a boy, okay? Or she's a girl. I'm, I'm like her. I will put on her kind of shoes. My, my daughter used to put her foot into my wife's shoes, and I looked at it and said, all right, that's, that's a good sign, okay? Um, but... But actually, you know, we all grow up and then we only look at other human beings to say, I'm in this species. You know what species that is? That's the first Adam species. And how does the first Adam act? Badly. <laughs> how does the first Adam think? All about me. <laughs> and then we say, oh, of course I love you, but if, you, if loving you gets really hard, we'll get divorced. Oh, you know, and I'll say sorry later or something like that. You know, we, we say, oh, we're going to offer you this really great product. You know, it's on TV or it's on the Internet. We're going to offer you this. It's going to change your life, and your life is going to be really great. And it kind of sort of does some okay things for your life, but mostly it makes them money. <laughs> That's how the first kind of species, the first kind of version of this Adam acts. Now, let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, and let's drop down a couple verses. So let's go to verse 47. The first man was from the earth, a man of dust. That's just like us. The second man is from heaven. We need to be like the one from heaven. It's a new kind of human being. As was the man of dust, so also are those who are of the dust, that's us. And as is the man of heaven, so also are those who are of heaven. That's why you need union with Christ. <laughs> now here is where it gets interesting. Just as we have borne the image of the man of dust, so there's this thing. There's an image of Adam. We're taking on that image. We're giving off that image. You know, there's, there was, a, there was a, our forefather named Adam, and we're just like him. And then, we're, and then when people meet us, we, they, they, meet, they meet something like the first Adam. You know? I'll meet Peter, and if he acts like Adam, you're like, oh, it's like, it's Peter, but it's really a lot like Adam. I meet Carissa. If she, the way she acts, it's a lot like Adam. That's what we're like. Right? The image of Adam is coming off us. But now here's where it goes. We shall also... As just as we have borne the image of the man of dust, but now something new has happened. We shall also bear the image of the man of heaven. Do you want to know what the union with Christ does? There is an image of the man of heaven. Who is that? Jesus. 
if you are united to him by the bond of the Holy Spirit, and by the way, most of us think Jesus is super far away, and then I guess somehow the Holy Spirit, you know, I hope the, the, the bond of the, I, I, if you think of the Holy Spirit as like a, a broadband connection, you know, it's not like a little weak, <laughs> weak little Wi-Fi connection, because, you know, it weakens out when it gets farther. God is omnipotent and omnipresent. There's no such thing as spatial distance. In fact, the Holy Spirit brings Jesus right into here. He's not even here. He's right in here. You see it? And since he's in here, we're united to Christ. When we now are united to Christ, we bear the image. We, we reflect and give off the image of the man of heaven, Christ. When people meet us now, they sometimes see the old Adam. But really, there's a new kind of life united into us. And there's an image of the new kind of heavenly man. It should come off us. That's what's happening. That's what the, that's what the Holy Spirit is doing. Now, let me um, take you back to Colossians. Let's go to Colossians. So if you have your Bible, go, let's go back to Colossians chapter 3, verse 10. Colossians 3, verse 10. So, verses 1 through 4, I mean, I, w I wish I could explicate all this stuff in between, but we don't have time, so we just, you, know, you got to trust me that we get to verse 10, and all is flowing out of verses 1 through 4. You're united to Christ. Your life is hidden with Christ in God. When he's revealed, who you really are will actually be revealed. And then he goes on to say, so now act a certain way. Put on holiness, put on righteousness, put on love and, and patience with each other and take off certain things. But then he goes, let's go, let's go on this. Now verse 10, listen. And have, and have put on, that's you, you and I, put on the new self which is renewed in knowledge after the image of its creator. You see what that user are saying? When you... Believe in Jesus, you have a new self. That's another language for who you really are is hidden with Christ. It's image. It's like there's a new self that's united to Christ. Put on that self. Put it on. So don't put on the old Adam. That's what it's, actually we don't have to put him on, he's just there. You have to get rid of that old Adam. Put on the new human 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 image, the new kind of humanity. And then, and what is it? It's made after the image of your creator. What does that mean? It's after the image of God. And you know what that's a reference to? If you've been in the church, you should know this. And I'm sure pretty much every, all of you know this. What is the Bible's definition of the human being? Most of us, we figure out what it means to be a human being from man, from each other. But what does God say the human being is? If you read Genesis chapter 1, he makes, the, he makes the fish, and he makes the birds, and he makes every little thing that creeps upon the ground. That's what the Bible says. And then he says, it's good. But then he said he makes this special creature from the dust, breathes life into him, and he said he made man from the image of God. He made him male and female in the image of God. So, you know, women, you're not in any less in the image of God, absolute equality. You want to know where the equality of when men and women come from? Genesis chapter 1. That's where it comes from. Genesis chapter 1. All right. um, and we're made in the image of God. That's what it means to be truly human. Now it's there, but godless people are always trying to suppress it. <laughs> you know, even right in our schools, you're, you're a biological accident. <laughs> that's, that's, like, that's denying it. But even your atheist friends, I'm sure almost all of you have some kind of coworker or friend who's an atheist. Do you notice that they say, I have to live for love and justice? Where does that come from? Because they're made in the image of God. And then, of course, then they go out to the world and they forget all about love and justice, it's all about me. That's Adam. It's Adam. What does it mean to be human? Um, it means to be made in the image of God. And I want to talk about um, the one thing that it that that is needed to be in the image of God. It's like it's like Jesus. I want to change the language a little bit. Um, 
Let's go to one more passage in the Bible, and I and we looked at it yesterday, but I want to um, pull it out a little bit more. Go to Galatians chapter six. Where is it? Here we go. If you're there, I need to take a moment. Actually, Galatians five. You should know this verse. It's talking about what is in the flesh. What's flesh? Adam's life. <laughs> no God. No Holy Spirit. How can you have the life of the new Adam if there's no Holy Spirit bonding you to the new Adam? You see it? There's no union with Christ through to the new Adam. So if you have no uh, none of the new Adam, the new kind of humanity in you, all you have is the old Adam. That's the flesh. And then it goes on to say this. So let's go to verse, uh, let's just see, verse 19. Now the works of the flesh, that's the, new, the old Adam, are evident. What are they? Sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity. I mean, all this nasty, terrible stuff. That's us. <laughs> that's our culture. That's pretty much every culture. Some more than others. Some like sorcery. This culture just likes enmity. You know, we just like hatred. We're like racist and we just hate each other. Okay? This culture, like, we're into sorcery. Let's, like, worship certain kind of demonic things and then take power over people. All right? Uh, dissensions and rivalry and rage and orgies and all these, like, things. I warn you, those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. How can the first Adam inherit the kingdom of God? There's no new heavenly man in him. But now let's go to, this is the verse that I hope many of you know. It's a famous verse. Verse 22. But the fruit of the Spirit, the fruit of the Spirit is, by the way, did you notice it's not fruits of the Spirit. One fruit. Singular. If you go to the Greek, it's very clear. It's singular. The fruit of the Spirit is Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. It's not eight things or whatever it is. It's love, joy, peace, patience, kindness. It's all of it. It's all of it. It's all of it. What comes off of being united to Christ? There's a new kind of human being, and that new kind of human being images God. That new kind of human being images God. And what comes off of imaging God? It's holiness. Holiness is the fruit of the Spirit. The Spirit takes the holiness in Christ and then pours the new kind of man, the new kind of humanity, the new kind of, and then puts it into us, and then we image God, which is another way of saying we image Christ. See, the Son of God, He's God, Became a human being, which is supposed to image God, but we don't image God. We actually image the devil. That's what Adam did. The Adam chose to image the devil. Between trusting in God and trusting in the devil, he chose the devil. And then guess what? Everybody since then who is in Adam, we trust lies, which are satanic lies. We don't. So we like God's word, whatever. Oh, this, this, this thing sounds really exciting. It's actually a satanic lie. We image Satan. That's what the old man does. But if you want it to actually be what a human being is really supposed to be, you have to be the kind of human being that images God. So God himself became the human being to image God for the sake of human beings, so human beings can be really what they're supposed to be. You understand that human beings are not just like this weak, terrible thing that we are now. That we're supposed to be something like God on earth. Now I want to say um, uh, a couple things here. Let me see. Um, I had so much content here. I want to make sure I get this correct. Okay. Um, I, I, I once gave this picture. Uh, and I was looking for this, but I, I didn't piece it together. But... Um, Imagine three bottles of water. The reason I imagine three bottles of water is the whole world is looking, is thirsty. And there's water being offered. 
One of those bottles of water, just, just picture it, has like some weird brown things in it. And it's got these ugly yellow things in it. And you open the bottle up, oh, and it smells. So, I offer you, the, you're thirsty. Hey, Peter, are you thirsty? Want to drink this? Want to drink it? <laughs> right. You're like, that might be something really disgusting in there. I'm not going to drink that. Sorry. And we don't drink it. Okay? Um, most of us see some kind of, uh, I think, you hear a message and people think that seems obviously poisonous, obviously evil. Okay? And that would be sort of like obvious sin. But then there's a second bottle. Now think of the second bottle. It looks perfectly clear. You open the cap up and you smell it. Odorless. Must be good. But what if I told you there's a poison in it which is perfectly odorless and colorless? Now, is there any chemical, chemical engineers or chemists in there? Is there such things that are colorless, odorless? It looks just like water. And if you drink it, you die? Hey, you don't need a chemist. I, I took chemistry in high school. There's like, you know, like sulfuric acid looks like water. <laughs> sulfuric acid looks like water. So, you drink it, and it, don't drink that. That's got sulfuric acid in it. It looks just like, well, I don't know if it has an odor, but if it's long, it probably won't smell it. You know what that is? So, evil teaching. I think that's like the brown, gooky, ugly stuff. Then there's other things. It looks like the real thing. I would say that's Phariseeism. It's legalism. And then there's only, and then there's a three, there's a third cup of water. It's pure. It's good and it's pure. You know what that is? Well, we, that's the real stuff. That's the stuff that will actually quench your thirst. If you're really thirsty, you need a pure glass of water. You know what holiness is? It's pure goodness. That's what it is. Holiness is that which is good, and it's pure. So I'm trying to give you a definition. Most people think of holiness as like, oh, it's like Mother Teresa or something. <laughs> it's like if a person is so good that they're like, so kind of like light will like, like light, light off your head or something like that. But holiness is actually, so part one, what does it mean to be human? Part two, we're talking about holiness. The resurrected Son of God, who is now the new kind of Adam, you know what he gives us when we're united to him? If you're united to him, you know what comes from him? Holiness comes from him. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, all of it. So let's put it to you this way. Hey, son, I love you. I love you. You, you actually love them. But there's no peace and patience. <laughs> no peace and patience. I love you, I love you. You take them out to the baseball field, and then they can't hit. You're so stupid, what the heck? Why can't you hit the ball? Make the play, make the play, are you kidding? And then your son just goes, but dad's supposed to love me, but like, since I, I, I missed the ball, I guess tonight he hates me. <laughs> is this the way we, we, we parent our children? Yes. <laughs> At least this is what I do. <laughs> Hudson, I love you so much, but like, you know, when he can't hit the ball, it's like, argh, and the veins pop out of my, you know, like, argh, right? And, you know, you, you just change it, you know, like, oh, your kid can't do algebra, or your kid can't sit still, or you like, spill the milk, which everybody's done. Everybody's spilled the milk your whole life, but like, your three-year-old spills milk and like, argh, and they're like, no patience. You know what just happened there? There's goodness, but it's impure goodness. It's like that. If it's really bad, I love you. You punch your kid in the head, that's like the gross water. Everybody knows that's gross water. Oh, I love you, but you're really legalistic and judgmental. You really, you do love your child, that's like the Pharisee's water. Your child goes, hmm. And we all wonder, because we love our children, but we love our children with the love of Adam. The humanity of Adam is how we love our children. That's how we love everybody. It's impure. But what if you love 
with love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, self-control, all, all of it together, then people would go, oh. You know what that love is? That's the love of the new Adam, of the heavenly man. And you can only have it if you're bonded, united to him, and the Holy Spirit is putting into your life. You see it? You want to know what union with Christ is supposed to do? It's supposed to do this. <laughs> That's what we're here to do. We're here to become in the image of God, which is the new kind of human being. And you can't have it unless you have the whole, the whole divine humanity of Christ. So that's why last night, some people said, I just want the justification. Jimmy said justification. And then so this is what we typically do. You come to church and you cherry pick one thing from Jesus. Oh my gosh, I, 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 I look at porn too much. I know this is really bad. Do you know what I need? I need Jesus. What do I want from Jesus? Renovation. Fix this part, Jesus. This part's horrible. Please forgive it and then fix it. And then after you, somehow you get some victory over the sin, you were a drunk or you're an angry person or something. You were depressed. Jesus, fix it. And sometimes we get angry, like you're depressed, you're still not, you're still depressed two years later. You didn't fix it. <laughs> so inst instead of like loving Jesus, now you're like, now I hate you. <laughs> you start like, you actually blame God. Why? Because you don't want the whole Christ. We actually, just like John Calvin, we want to break Christ up into pieces and then take the only part we want. And then the pharisaical way is like, oh, justification. I've been forgiven of my sins. Lifelong get out of jail free card. Sunday morning, forgiveness. Awesome. Justification. Legal standing before God. When I get before the judgment seat, I'm going to say, I put on, I, I'm, I was actually a really bad person. I was, I, yeah, I was kind of an impatient dad. I really love money more than my wife because I like power, you know, when I'm at work and I want everybody just to be, see me as I'm, I'm so successful when I put on my Armani suit. On Sunday morning, oh, forgiveness is so great. This is why we're talking about union with Christ. You have to be united to the whole Christ. What does it mean to be united to the whole Christ? To get a whole new kind of humanity that defeats death. A resurrection humanity. The pathway to the resurrection humanity is through the cross. Not just his cross, your cross, my cross. See, if you're united to Jesus, you are united to him in his death and his resurrection. You know what? That means there's a part of us that's dying. And some parts of us have to die with the crucified Christ. Only then can we get the new kind of divine, death-defeating humanity filled with holiness. See, that's, that's what the fruit of the Spirit is. There's one fruit of the Spirit. The Holy Spirit gives, surprise, holiness. <laughs> what? That's why we call him the Holy Spirit, by the way. You know that? Because he gives holiness, the holiness of humanity. Of Christ. Now I want to say one more thing and then let's shift gears. So we're in part two of four. If you talk, do you listen to millennials? I'm not even just talking about the ones who go to church. I'm talking about the ones who don't go to church. Some they used to go to church and then they left church. Or they never went to church at all, but they, then they tried things. They first tried money. I'm going to get a great career. And then, you know, they're so lonely. And then they have a few hookups in college but then they want real love. So then they start looking for real love. And then they, they date two girls and heck, maybe they even date a guy. And then that person loves them with impure love. And that impure love breaks them. And then they start thinking, maybe there's a God. They'll check out different religions. And then they go to a Pharisaical Christian church, and that, and that church is all legalistic. That's not the thing. See, then they offer them the, the colorless, odorless water, and that ain't enough. And then when you talk to these people, you know what they say? It's funny, because they think they tried Christianity. <laughs> all they tried was Phariseeism. But that's the same thing. 
There's all these churches that have a cross. They talk about the Bible. They even use the same language, but it's not the same Jesus. And then they go, and then this is what they say. I'm looking for something authentic. Authenticity. I'm searching for authenticity. I'm looking for something real. You know what they mean, right? You know what that is? If you take all, of course, they have no biblical knowledge. You know, all they're really saying is, I'm looking for holiness. That's what they're saying. They don't know that's what they're saying. They have no idea. They're saying, I'm looking for Galatians chapter 5, verse 22. They don't know that's what they're saying, but that's what they're saying. I'm looking for a human being that's like the lying, phony jerks like everybody else. Something real. So when they're saying authentic, they don't want authentic jerk. I want an authentic liar. Okay, I, they don't need to, to find an authentic liar. That's everybody. <laughs> it's like it's on TV. We market this product. Get this product, and you will like you know you will have super hair, and then the girls will flock to you, <laughs> right? And then they, they 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 know that's not authentic. That's authentic lying. <laughs> that's authentic lying. They, they don't need authentic lying. They want authentic goodness, which is another way of saying. Don't you want holiness? I long for holiness. I think there's some holiness in this room. And yesterday when I came to your church and walked with you and I see, you know, you, you guys have like great good equipment and, you know, you have some good musicians up here and you have some good, but you know, like everything is just a little imperfect, just like my church. <laughs> you know what? All the churches are like that. There's a few churches that have like a super band and everything is run perfectly. That's like 1% of the churches. <laughs> None of that's the important thing. You walk into a room and you see people who adore Jesus. They long to be like Jesus. I don't think I'm like Jesus, but I want to be like Jesus. And I want his life to flow into me. That's the, you know how you know if the Holy Spirit's in the room? People just want Jesus. <laughs> Some people go, I don't do tongues. How do I know if there's any Holy Spirit in me? You know how you know if there's Holy and Holy Spirit? Because you want Jesus. It's that easy. Because you know why? Because people who have no Holy Spirit in them, they don't like Jesus. <laughs> they think Jesus is stupid. It's so nice that works for you. But, you know, that's your truth, not my truth. No Holy Spirit. The person who says that, Holy Spirit's not affecting them. But the person who says, Mm, you know, they're, they, they're angry at Jesus and they're constantly interested. You know, you, you talk about Jesus and they start, they start looking at this. You know, it's weird. You think they hate Jesus, but the Holy Spirit is kicking down the door. It's weird. It's really weird. The person that, as soon as you start talking about Jesus, the person looks bored. No Holy Spirit at work. The person you say, I mentioned church, and they're like, they get that nervous look. And they even start getting angry. You know what's happening? It's like the Holy Spirit's kicking down the door. It's really weird. There's people who hate God, but they're atheists. Isn't that just irrational? <laughs> they hate a person that doesn't exist. Supposedly, it's like you hate a, 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 a non-existent person. You know, what's, what's wrong with you? And they keep hating this person. Jesus is phony. Jesus is phony. But they're like, they have to go out of their way to tell them. It's like, you know what? Holy Spirit is kicking down the door. They, just ne they, st they still think Jesus is the Pharisee's Jesus. They need to meet the Jesus the real Jesus, our Jesus. You know what they need to meet? They need to meet the holiness of Jesus. It comes from me and you. Okay. Let's go to part three. I would like you to go to an important passage. 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Okay. No way I'm going to make up. 10, 15. All right. 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Oh, 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians chapter 12. So this is what we're going to do for the rest of this weekend. What does being united to the image of God look like? What does it look like when you are part of the real divine humanity, that image of God? And so let's read this passage, very important passage. And what I'm going to tell you right now is this message 
the next message I'm going to say, you know, after we take a little break, and then tonight's message, that's all weird. <laughs> it's all weird. You know why it's weird? Because we're so used to being like the dying, nasty, satanic Adam. We, don't, we have no idea how to be like the new Adam, the holy Adam. We're so, we're like so used to being, we, we, we have to be, but we need to be united to the new Adam. And here is a big clue, all right? So 2 Corinthians chapter 12, are you there? Verse 1 through 10. This is Paul writing his second letter to um, the church of Corinth. Church of Corinth is filled with gifts. Lots of exciting stuff happened in church, filled with rich people and poor people. And the Corinthian church started saying, Paul, you're not a real pastor. You're not for real. And so saying the second letter to the church of Corinth is in a sense a Paul's defense of that I really know the gospel. I really am a, a real preacher of the gospel for you. Okay? And here's how he goes on. I must go on boasting. So he says, he says I'm going to boast. I don't really like to do this, but let me boast. Um, though there is nothing to be gained by it, it's a stupid thing to do, but I'll do it. I will go on to visions and revelations of the Lord. I know a man in Christ, that's himself, he's talking about himself, who 14 years ago was caught up in the third heaven, it's weird stuff, right? Whether in the body or out of the body, I don't know. God knows. And I know that this man was caught up into paradise. Whether in the body or out of the body, I don't know, God knows. Anybody have this kind of experience? I haven't ever had this experience. I don't even know what the third heaven is. <laughs> Actually, nobody knows. <laughs> nobody knows. Except Paul, apparently. And he barely knows. Verse 4. And he, he's talking about himself, heard things that cannot be told which man may not utter. On behalf of this man, I will boast. But on my own behalf, I will not boast. Except of my weaknesses. So, he went through something spiritual that is so outstanding, so absolutely amazing. I mean, I can only think of like two other people in the whole history of humanity who experienced anything close to this. There is Moses, and he taught, we go up to the mountains to show me your glory. And God says, well, you can't see my face or you'll die. But what I'll do is I'll stick you in a little pet, pet, crack of this rock, and you can just watch my back when I walk by. And then when he did it, he just melted down and started yelling, holy, holy, holy. This is what you're like, a God slow to anger. And he just melted down in worship. And the other one is Elijah. Elijah <laughs> saw God and, and he and he thought, I, I, I'm going to die because I'm just a horrible, sinful man. And, so he started crying, holy, holy, holy. Because that's God. So Paul had this kind of experience, but he, but he says, but actually, of that guy, the guy who saw this, I can boast about. He's doing something kind of tricky there. He's like saying, you think you, you've seen, you have like really things that you can brag about spiritually. That guy who experienced that, that guy has something to brag about. But actually, let me talk about just me, of who I am. It's kind of weird. He's talking about himself, but he says, I'm not going to talk about that guy. Who I am, I'm going to boast, what did he say? In my weaknesses. If I should wish to boast, I would not be a fool, for I would be speaking the truth, but I refrain from it so that no one may think more of me than he sees in me or hears from me. So to keep me from becoming conceited because of the surpassing greatness of the revelation, a thorn was given to me in my flesh, in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to harass me to keep me from becoming conceited. What is this passage about? It's about boasting. It's about conceit. It's about pride. Three times I pleaded with the Lord about this, that it should leave me. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect there's that word again, in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses 
so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Let me say it another way. So that the humanity of Christ can be flowing into me. So that the union of Christ can flow out of me. For the sake of Christ, then, I am content with weaknesses. Can any of you say that? Because of Jesus, because I'm united to Jesus, I am content with weakness. That's, what the heck are you talking about? <laughs> what the heck are you talking about, Paul? Right? I'm content with weaknesses and insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities, for when I am weak, that's when I'm actually strong. That's the Bible. Now, I want to say a few things about this. Um, this is where in part three. You know why boasting? Everybody's into boasting. Now you go, I, I never boast. Of course you do. Of course you do. We all do. You don't comb your hair? I mean, you, would, you, you have to wear Ray-Bans. You can't just wear some cheap pair of sunglasses. You, it's got to be Ray-Bans. That's boasting. I know the right brand. Do you, do you, where do you shop? I shop at Gap. I don't shop at, like, Target. <laughs> Who shops at Target? Don't say Target. Like, only loser. Okay, Kmart, even worse. Oh, Goodwill store. I get my clothes from Goodwill store. Where do you go to school? Where did you go to school? Oh, I, I, you know, I went to Stanford. Or I went to Berkeley. Oh, you know, I, I, you know, I, I was a high school dropout. I didn't make it through. <laughs> Couldn't make it through, you know, algebra. Is that what you go around telling people? High school dropout. Couldn't make it through Algebra 1. Is that what you like to go tell me about? I'm content in my weakness. No, 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 no. We all have something that you have to say, this is my power. The human race seeks power, and out of the power, not weakness. Power is the opposite of weakness. What's, there's weakness. The opposite of weakness is strength and power. If you can afford certain clothes and have a certain name and stuff like that, you know all that is? It's like chopping up in power. Everybody who's poor, and I'm talking dirt poor, you know what? You know how they feel? They get in front of somebody that has strength and power, and then they feel that they're weak, and then they're ashamed. And you and I, when we are weak, you know what we do? And when we go out to the whole world, you know what we, that we do? Every day, we find some basis for boasting. That's what we do. That's what we do. You know where that comes from? The devil. That's where it comes from. Um, if you go back to the, the drama of Genesis, God makes Adam and Eve in his image. No angel, no elephant. No dog, no gorilla, no lion. The lion is the king of the jungle. That's wrong. You know who's the king of the jungle? Man. The lion has no chance against man. Oh, the lion's the king of the jungle. That's stupid. That's stupid. We're the king of the jungle. We're made in the image of God. Not the lion. The lion has no chance. Really, it's true. Is that true? It's absolutely true. But... Here, this, is, this is what the devil in the guise of the serpent said. So, you're living in paradise. Everything is given to you, including a totally gorgeous wife. <laughs> the fruit, the food just comes, just comes out of the ground. And God literally walks around with you. He's like your buddy. And then the devil shows up and says, oh, you're not going to die if you eat that. You know what? If you eat that, you'll be like God. You'll be like God. You notice how that's a weird little twist? You already are like God. You're already in the image of God. The devil took the one that's in the image of God and tempted them with a way of being like God. So now I want to offer you like a, a really important piece of theology. In the Bible, if you go to seminary, as a few people of, of us in here have done. They teach, you'll teach something like this. There are two main categories of the attributes of God. So we're, we're supposed to be like God. One, at, one set of attributes is called what they call the incommunicable attributes. Incommunicable. 
That means it can't be given to anybody else. You guys know what like a, a communicable disease is, right? You know, you have like, somebody has like liver cirrhosis. That's an incommunicable disease. If you hang out with them, you're not going to get liver problems. But if a person has, you know, the flu, that's a communicable disease. You hang out with them, it's like, oh, great. That's a communicable disease. There are some things that cannot be given to anyone else. God has certain attributes that make him God. He, it, it doesn't go to anybody else. That's incommunicable. You know what that is? Omniscience. Omnipotence. Omnipresence. I call those like the godness of God stuff. You know what it is? It's power. It's power. Then there's another set of attributes that God can, they call them the communicable attributes. The attributes that you actually, that God, that are really of God, they're truly divine, but it can give to someone not God. You know what those attributes are? They're things like this. Love, justice, beauty, holiness. When God made Adam and Eve in the image of God, you know what he made them to be? Holy, like him. Not power. When the devil said, you can be like God, you know what he's saying? You can have power like God. And everybody now, for the rest, since all made to be in the imaging, the first Adam, now we're into power. <laughs> We're all into power and boasting. Power and boasting. You know why Paul says this thing? If as, as long as I'm in Christ, I can be weak. You know why? Because holiness and weakness, weakness is no problem for holiness. If anything, this is really interesting, weakness helps you in holiness. You know why? Because whenever any of us have any kind of power, we, it all goes to our head. We think we're so great. <laughs> I, I'll, I'll, let, me, let me share with you something that's, um, um, you know, um, JP shared with you that I went to Stanford, right, Stanford University. I, 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 I don't usually tell people I went to Stanford. You know why? Because honestly, for the whole first half of my life, it was, that's all I wanted. I was born with a gift of certain intellectual gifts. That was my power. That was the thing that was my boast. And then I wanted to have it on my name so that the whole world would know what a smart, awesome guy that I am. So I wanted like the world to put like a name badge of boasting of what a special guy I am, and that would be Stanford. I mean, you know, somebody says from Stanford, it's like, dude, super smart guy, right? Something like that. That's what everybody thinks, right? And so, it took me somewhere into my 20s before I realized this is totally evil. <laughs> this is the thing inside of me that's super sick and like the devil. It's good. <laughs> it was a good thing. Intellect, intellect and, and your mind being able to put things together into the world, that's a, that's a special and beautiful gift, is it not? But if it's about boasting, then you're just running after the devil. The devil said you can have power and be like God because that's what we want. We want, we want to boast and then we says, now worship me. <laughs> now worship me. You know, that, that's, that's what a lot of parenting is. When your child doesn't worship the thing you worship and then doesn't worship you, then, then, that, then the lack of patience comes out. And that's how they know, oh, it's unholy. That, that's not what they say, of course. They just go, eh. Then they just move away to college and then they don't come back because it's unholy. Um, one piece that I want to offer you in this. Holy, holiness is what the Bible talks about. Now, one more piece, and let's now move to the final portion of my message. In the Old Testament, when they met, encounter God like Elijah, or the angels go before God, what do they say? Holy, holy, holy. Not almighty, almighty, almighty. That's not what they say. Now, there are places in the Bible that says you are mighty and you, only you can create this and make all things. That's true, but that's not the main note. It's sort of like the, you know, when you sing a song, there's the main, har you know, there's the main melody and then there's sort of like a side harmony. It's sort of like the God, you are powerful. That's sort of like the minor tune. The main tune is holy, holy. But then you get to the New Testament. And the New Testament, you know what you get? 
you get holiness walking the earth. That's Jesus. You want to know what holiness looks like? Jesus. It's not complicated. It's Galatians chapter 5, 22. It's Jesus. It's everybody who starts to become conformed to the image of God through Jesus Christ by being united to God. Those people who seek that, they start to become strange, odd people. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness. Some have money, some don't. Some are somebody in the world. Some are Many are nobodies in the world. But then the New Testament says something else. It says God is love. I think the New Testament is through Jesus is showing us what is the heart of holiness. You know what's at the heart of holiness? It's Trinitarian love. That's what it is. The character of God is holiness. The central activity of God is love. It's so central, the New Testament even says God is love. You want to know what the image of God is that we're getting by being it's a holy love, and you offer it in weakness. Now I want to close my message. The image of God in Christ through weakness. Usually when we gain some kind of strength or power, you know what it inflames our pride. Even Paul said it. If I go around talking to you about those great revelations, it just makes me conceited. But actually, God, I had this thorn in my flesh is actually even a messenger of Satan. This is so crazy. It's actually a messenger of Satan. And he's, he says, take this away. <laughs> take this away. I even asked three times, take it away. And you know what the Lord said? No, actually my grace is sufficient. For my power is made perfect, is made complete. Perfection doesn't mean like absolutely perfect with no in mistakes. Perfection in this sense is to become complete, not incomplete. For my power is to be completed in your weakness. Look at Jesus. Did he go to Stanford? No. Did he make lots of money? Did he have, you know, the perfect wife with 2.2 cars and 2.2 kids and the perfect life? You know, do you, you notice the perfect life filled with power, that's, that's an atom boast. The American dream is an atom power boast. It really is. So it's not bad, but it's kind of the boast. And everybody who kind of makes the boast, we feel good about ourselves because that's our boast. And the ones who don't, we feel ashamed of ourselves. But actually, you know what, Jesus actually, and, we, we, and, we, and nowadays, if some kind of like affliction happens in our life, we get angry at God. You don't love me, God. You don't love me. My life was supposed to be this perfect dream. You know, I was supposed to have like that, that perfect wife and the and I was supposed to go to the good school and get the and the perfect 2.2 kids and the 1.2 dog. I don't know what the 0.2 dog looks like, but you know. And we're supposed to have that 2.2 garage to fill our 2.2 cars. And what is this cancer stuff? What is this with, with my wife that has depression? Well, what's the deal with like, you know, like I studied really, really hard in college, you know, 10 years ago, and now my job just went to the other side of the world. What's with that? I'm going to lose my house. What's with my, what's with my son having Alzheimer's? I mean, not Alzheimer's, um, you know, autism. My, my mother has Alzheimer's. What's with that? You know, we say we shake our fist at God. Because you know why? When we think about God, you want his power. You're not even looking at the real God. If that's the God you pray for, the only thing we want, God, is something from God. Like, so before, this goes back to the question, we don't want the whole Jesus, we just want the forgiveness. Oh, I just need you to fix this part. It's the bad part of me. Just fix it, please. But we don't, we don't want to be united to the whole Jesus. So, and then when we pray prayers, we just want the power of God so that we can have power and that we can feel happy in the post, which is really satanic. We have satanic prayers to God, but you know why God doesn't answer us? Because you're not praying to God. You're praying to the figment of the imagination of God. You're praying to a phony image of God. You're just praying to the God of power, not the God who is really holy love. See it? 
And then what does God do? Gosh, this God is strange. He actually allows weakness and affliction to come into our life. Because you know what he's doing? He's inviting you into saying, I want you to find out that holiness is greater than money. I want you to find out that my love, my holy love, the new humanity of Christ that can defeat death is greater than your perfect life. It's a lot better than your perfect life. It's better than your perfect life. It's resurrection life. And resurrection life is best seen, and you will more likely experience it when you're weak. So embrace your weakness, because there you'll stop being so prideful. You can start, just put that pride, pride and power away, and you can find out a different kind of power, a resurrection life power. Um, I want to offer you a couple of examples, and then we'll close this message. Okay, so we're supposed to be holy. Pastor, this is a really weird, I don't even know if I like the way you're saying. I'm supposed to be weak? So you're telling me that I'll get married and or I'll go up and I won't get into the college I really want. That stinks. And then I'll get the job they don't quite want and then I'll get laid off from it. That stinks. And then I'm going to get married and then I'm going to have a kid and I'll get autism. I have a kid who have autism. That kind of stinks. And God is happy with that? <laughs> Actually, in all of those things, He's loving you. And in every one of those places, He's giving you a chance that you can be united to Christ in His death and His resurrection. All your old Adam flesh is now, every single one of those instances, He's offering you a cross so that on the cross of your autistic child, your fleshly wicked, pride-boasting, satanic humanity can die. And you can discover the life-giving, conquering, holy humanity of Christ. That's where you're going to learn. And is this real? Oh, it's real. Oh, it's real. This isn't just some weird pastor talk. I'm, I'll give you two examples from today. Anybody ever heard of Joni Erickson Tata? Anybody who knows Joni Erickson Tata is? So her story, for those of you who don't know, when she was a teenager, she jumped into a pool, hurt her neck, paralyzed from the neck down as a teenager. She was a Christian. So she searched through the whole Bible. Is God a good God? I thought God is a bad God. But now I'm paralyzed from the neck down as a teenager. She found out God is a good God. Jesus is everything. He can conquer this. Now she has a ministry called Johnny and Friends. Her weakness became the power of God, the power of Christ, the holy love and life of the resurrection. It's a new kind of humanity of Christ. It's going out to the whole world. I have a friend. His son was born with some kind of genetic problem, so he's paralyzed everywhere. He can't, he's like, the only thing he can really move is his eyes. Isn't that incredible? He's going to go to Johnny and Friends retreat soon. It's one of the most beautiful. You want, to know, you want to know where God can be seen? Go to the weak. Find him in your weakness. You guys know who Nick Vujicic is? He's a little more famous now. <laughs> no arms, no legs. You ever listen to the guy talk? The guy has like life just flowing out of him. You know where that life comes from? When you see Nick Vujicic's face, you know who you're looking at? You're looking at the face of Jesus. You know where that joy is coming from? It's coming from the union to Christ. He is reflecting the new humanity of Jesus. Most people, you meet them, you meet Adam. But when you meet Nick Vujicic, you meet someone, you're meeting a humanity like Jesus. All of us, actually, we don't know it, we're all Nick Vujicic and Johnny Erickson Tata. Somewhere in our life, you have a weakness. It's just not as obvious as theirs. Their weakness is obvious. No arms and no legs. Super obvious. Okay? Paralyzed from the neck down. That's super obvious. But every Christian is Nick Vujicic and Johnny. Everybody. In your life is a weakness. In your weakness, 
you will find Christ. And when you can find the life that can conquer and help you win and bear up that weakness, that not just that just fix this weakness, but actually have Christ in and through the weakness, now you're taught. Now you will find out. That's the pathway to the union with Christ. That's the thing that's really weird. The whole world has affliction. What they don't know is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, all that in the affliction, in the weakness, and humility. All the boasting goes away. It's just like, I'm happy. Why are you so happy? Jesus. It's the only boast I got. Jesus. Let's pray.